All right, everybody, this is Founder Laverune, and I am going to now show you how to build a character using Fantasy Ground Unity. This is not the all hands method because there are different rule sets that may require different steps. I am using the D&D 5th edition rule set with the latest version of Unity. I have all of the core books and I am also going to be using a lot of third party content. So as you can see on my tabletop, I have a blank character sheet and I have a bunch of things in my library loaded. When I say things, I mean supplements and content that allows me to add or embellish or enhance an already built character or something that's a little less thorough or complete. So I have a whole bunch of things listed here. I'm not going to go down the list, but there is all the core books plus a bunch of other stuff from the DMs Guild. And a lot of these were developed by our own community. So if you're interested in these, a lot of these were built by Grim Press or by Rob2E. So if you're interested in any of these, um, go to the DMs Guild and check it out. Just look under those publishing titles. You'll find a majority of their content. A few of these are not by Rob2E, but there's or or grim but the nonetheless we have a lot of content so if you're new in order to get all this content you either have to purchase it through the fantasy ground store or go to the dms guild and your third option is to build it yourself well we're not going to cover that today that's a lot of content to go over if you're interested in building your own content similar to this i advise you take our game master series and it'd be game uh, gm 101 102 and 103 there are three separate classes 102 and 103 focus on creating your own content in the context of the D, &D uh, rule set but it also applies to most of the others so if you click on modules over here on the right this is where you activate your modules and they move the filter on the top of the library so if you need to change anything you do it now from the sidebar in the settings. So um, right now it looks like I have everything on display. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this sidebar. So now you go into the options instead of the library. And then you will simply click on sidebar. And then I'm gonna select create PC. And that narrows down the list so I don't get confused. I don't have a bunch of extra buttons that I don't need. I think that's pretty good for right now. Um, if you wanted to set a decal for like your session, I can go into my assets and images. And I can go to my campaign data. And if there's anything in here that I liked, like photo-wise, or, or even if it's just a background image, you can double click on it and it has to be in your campaign folder and you can set this as your background or whatever image you want. So I'm going to set that as my background image just for example. And there you go. So yes, we are always looking for teachers and volunteers to help direct traffic or whatever it is that you want to do. So nonetheless, um, if you don't want the obnoxious photo or you don't want anything, you can go into the options and change this background back to the default or you can turn it off. I'm going to turn it off for now. So custom decal is, is what it's on now. I can turn it off or I can go to the basic SmiteWorks one. I'm just going to go ahead and shut it off. There we go. So we got a nice clean slate. I'm going to bring up the combat tracker because I want to have that in case I need to test something. Whenever you're building um, NPCs or characters, it's a good idea to have the character on the combat tracker or the NPC so you can test whatever features that you're using. And then I went ahead and relocked the desktop. And so I locked those two windows. And now the actual the character sheet, I went into characters and clicked on this plus button and it brings up a whole new sheet. So I'm just going to call this character build. And if anyone's out there, if you have any specific type of character you'd like me to build, that's for the fifth edition rule set, uh, please mention it in the chat. I'll take a peek at it shortly. Um, right now we don't have anything set up, so it's pretty much a clean slate. I'm hoping to get a little community input if you guys want to see something specific built. So usually the first thing we start with is the ability scores. So while I'm waiting for engagement of any sort, I'm going to go ahead and just roll the stats and maybe that'll help us determine 
what we're going to build. So I'm going to draw these randomly. You can do the standard array, which is 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. And I don't know if you guys heard the big shakeup news for Adventure League, but they got rid of the requirement for Player's Handbook plus one. Now you can pretty much use most of the different books to build your characters. They did that early on for balance, and they're realizing that it's limiting people on how creative they are with their characters. So they've lifted that rule as of yesterday. So if you are a big um, Adventures League player, that's something to look forward to. Okay, so now what we're going to do is build this character in a organized way, and there is a certain way that you want to build a character. Now, if you're going to use the built-in character wizard, which is if you go to characters and you click the star, it will open up a character wizard, and the process of building is a little different than the way I'm showing you. This one is a lot less invasive. Like if you make choices and you want to change it, you don't have the problem of, of deleting a character and have to re redo it. So if you're going to make a character for first level, you can use the character wizard. It helps with, you know, if you're indecisive or not. But if you know what you're going to build and you're practiced enough with Fantasy Grounds, just do it the, the manual way. Just remember, once you start dragging stuff over, you cannot go back. You have to basically rebuild it or try to go in and, and uh, remember what was added and fix it. So just remember that. So what I'm going to do is roll a formula. This formula is slash die. And it's basically a dice roll. 4d6, which is four six-sided dice. K3. And what I did is I drug this down to the hotkeys. So before I hit enter in the story window here, I just drag and drop the text into a hot bar. Now I can just click it six times. It'll generate stats, do the math, and everything else. So let's see what we get. So I'm going to click it six times. And if any of you want to have any sort of uh, particular build type or whatever, uh, just let me know in the chat, and I will um, I will engage you or or you know, build whatever you want, or if no one shows up in, in the time allotted or in the early parts of this, I'll just go ahead and uh, build something. All right, so first of all, let's get the stats. So that's the first thing you do in Fantasy Grounds is that you do your ability scores. It may seem a little counterintuitive or backwards, but that's that's a, a good start is to get the ability scores out of the way. And it kind of requires that you do a little planning ahead of time. So if you have the... Other tools, they might be able to get you started, like such as D&D Beyond. You can kind of get a, a start on your character and then transfer it to Fantasy Grounds before you get it too far along. So I'm going to go ahead and roll six times. And I'm going to click on that formula or that dice roll shortcut six times. Now go ahead and move the combat tracker just in case. I'm going to put my character on the combat tracker just in case. And I guess I'll give him a portrait. Um, so I have one that I had commissioned when we joined the Kickstarter. It comes with Fantasy Grounds. And this dwarven cleric, this dwarf fighter is what he calls him. He's actually a cleric. Uh, this is Doric Rockfist. So that's my actual avatar that I that we paid for when we did the early, um, you know, the early release. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to start rolling the stats. Like I said, if you want to help pitch in and decide what, what we build here, this is the 5th edition rule set. So I'm going to go ahead and roll the stats first, and maybe that will help us determine where we want to put them. So I'm just going to do random rolls. I have a shortcut down here in the shortcut bar. So that's some pretty gnarly rolls there. So <laughs> I think we'll do the standard array today. Thank you. So that's how the, the, the rolls came out is just like that. Um, if you wanted to create a character and just plug them in by hand, you can do that. You don't have to go by any specific rule when you're building characters unless you're at a table where your GM requires it. If you're making them for yourself, you know what's fair and what isn't. So if I rolled again, let's see what happens.
eh, it's not bad actually. Um, but there again, see, you get a lot of unbalanced numbers. So sometimes it's better just to use the standard array. That's 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. So we need to pick where and what we're going to build so that we can assign those ability scores and stats. I was thinking about something a little more complex. Um, not a fighter. You know, clerics are pretty complex. They have domain spells and... Um, I always make clerics. I'm pretty familiar with how they work. Uh, warlocks can be a little difficult. Um, same with uh, certain barbarian types and also monks might be a little different. Uh, rogues and bards can be kind of challenging. Uh, sorcerers kind of and wizards kind of. So mostly the spell casting classes have a lot of little ins and outs that people forget or they're not familiar with. So it really depends on what you're going to build. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and just go down this list. I'm going to, I have a dwarf here, so I know he's going to be a dwarf. But what class should I be? Should be a cleric, a fighter, a barbarian, maybe, uh, maybe a rogue. I don't know. Um, but he's more like a fighter or a barbarian type or maybe even a, a, a combo. But I, I think a fighter um, is a little generic depending on what kind of fighter that you build. So I guess it would it would really depend on what what your tastes and flavor are. So I think I'm going to build a cleric. I'm pretty confident in doing that. Usually you want a pretty good wisdom, so I'm at least going to put my highest score, which is 15. And I'm going to put my dump stat in looks. I don't care if he looks good. He's a mean old dump, dumpy, grumpy dwarf, so who cares? Um, I'll leave his intelligence as 10. His strength is going to be 12. Um, let's see, 14 for dex. 13 for con. The reason I did that is because more than likely you're going to get wisdom and a con bonus when you pick dwarf. So we'll see what happens. So I'm going to play a shield dwarf, so that, that'll boost those stats up. So that's the first thing, is you do the ability scores. Then I'm going to open up backgrounds. And being that he's a dwarven cleric, I don't want to pick acolyte, so I'll pick something a little bit different. Maybe a clan um, crafter, something like that would be good. Or you can even do like a, a noble or maybe even a... And, uh, some sort of sage or whatever, but it's kind of gets boring if you always use acolyte. So I can go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead and want do the uh, clan crafter. And all I did was drag this over and drop it, and now it adds the traits that I need. So it added history and insight, which are two skills that I don't want to double up on, and I get one artisan tool for this particular background. So that's basically how that works. Now I'm going to close the backgrounds and open up race. Now this assumes that you have content. If you don't have any content or you just have the SRD, uh, you'll be a little bit limited on your choices, but you might have a couple things or maybe you're going to build your own. I'm not sure. But nonetheless, here are the races. I'm going to drag dwarf over here. So if I go to this, the player's handbook, dwarf, doesn't really matter which one you pick usually. I always just pick from the player's handbook. It's just still going to pull from the other books as long as you have it as they're set up right. And I'm going to pick a shield dwarf, which is native to the Forgotten Realms. And I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And it, it, it adjusted my strength by two. It adjusted my con by one and my wisdom is still 15. So I got a little bit of strength out of it and a little bit of con. And it tells you plus two to strength and then it did plus two to con. So that was a pretty good gamble there. So you got pretty good starting abilities and stats to begin with. And now the next step is the class. So when I pick my class, if I get any more skills, or even if you pick a race that gives you skills, just keep in mind what you already have. So I have history and insight, so I don't need to pick those. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the class banner on the right here, or the button, and I'm going to pick cleric. And again, I'll just use the player's handbook. And now it's prompting me to choose which skills. So if I click on skills, 
don't want history insight, so I'm going to do medicine and religion. There we go. And now I have to pick my domain. So at first level, clerics and wizards pretty much get their their domain. So I'm going to pick the war domain. I don't normally pick that. I usually pick light or some sort of, you know, maybe the forge domain might make more sense. But yeah, I'm going to pick the forge domain. So the forge dominion is actually a pretty cool uh, uh, domain for a worshiping cleric. So basically you're kind of worshiping the god of creation or, or forging. Uh, war would be cool if you kind of want more of a martial type. I kind of want more something more dedicated to his crafting, so that's why I chose that. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And now I have a bunch of things and features that were added. So I had my two um, skills that were added already. And being that I'm a dwarf, right off the bat, I can pick from Smith's tools, I can pick from Mason's tools or Brewer supplies. And then I also get one artisan tool um, from my background. So I probably do like masonry or some kind of, you know, more pottery or maybe even uh, stone cutting or maybe jewels or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this plus button on top and I'm going to add a couple new entries. So these are for my tools. Now you probably won't use these very often, but they're nice to have these ready to go. So this is basically the tools I'm adding. And I'm going to add Smith's tools. And I'm going to add probably jeweler. I'm going to just say they're both based off of wisdom, kind of like a handed down traditional type of knowledge instead of intelligence. And that also benefits me because I have a higher uh, constitution. So those are those will be really good scores or I have a really high wisdom too. So I went ahead and picked that and on my sheet here I'm going to notate that I picked Smith's tools. This is just for notes. And that way your GM or whoever you're playing with it understands what you chose. And then also on my artisan tools in parentheses, I'm going to put jewelers tools or something like that. So those are just little courtesy notes for yourself and to your GM. You don't have to do that, but that's something I, I really, uh, want you to consider and it says one it says dwarvish or one of your choice if you already speak dwarvish so i'm going to speak gnome so gnomish i believe let me double check yeah it's gnomish so you got to make sure that these languages are spelled correctly and then you have Blessing of the Forge, which is a feature that you get at first level. You have your Divine Domain, which has to do with the Forge. Uh, forge Spells, which are bonus spells. Respect of the Stout Folk is basically you have a higher respect because of what you do, especially among like dwarves and gnomes. So it says Respect of the Stout Folk. And then you have this... Uh, spell casting feature which we'll get into later uh, there's some additional spells that you can probably choose if you're using tasha's uh, it gives you additional cleric spells so we'll go ahead and put that over there in case and then you have a bonus proficiency and it says when you use this domain at first level you gain proficiency with heavy armor and smith's tools so I already had Smith's tools for my um, just my Dwarven heritage. So I'm going to go ahead and pick Mason. So there again, I've gained a whole other proficiency. 
And the reason I switched it, because I didn't anticipate the bonus proficiency, and it says that I have heavy armor proficiency. So I need to put that down under the proficiency area. Right now it says light, medium, and shields. So I had to manually add that. It doesn't do it automatically because it doesn't know what you're going to pick. Fantasy Grounds can't do everything automatic, but it does most things. So in this case, I need to add that. The other thing that you should know about is Dwarven Armor Training. So this one gives you light and medium, so that's where that medium came from. But my background and my god gives me the Blessing of the Forge, which is this bonus proficiency. So that's why I ended up with Mason's tools. So I'm going to go back here, add another tool. Click on the star, and that will make it proficient. And then again, it'll be a wisdom thing. So I have three different tool type sets I can use. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, I'm a clan crafter, so it, it makes sense. And let's see, anything else? So we already took care of the, the armor training. Now they have combat training as well. So elves and dwarves get this. So you have proficiency with battle hammer, hand axe, light hammer, war hammer. So the light hammer and the um, hand axes are already simple weapons. So the only two I have to include are the martial ones. So that means I'm allowed to use those two specific weapons because of my heritage, and in some cases it's because of the god you worship. So those will override the actual um, class limitations. So that's something you got to remember. Not always, but 99% of the time it does. And then you have Dwarven Resilience, which comes from your, your blood and your heritage. So you have advantage on saving throws against poison, and you have a resistance. So I'm going to go ahead and put this over here. And then you have your Stone Cunning, which is your ability to make better decisions and choices and, and uh, observations about stonework. And it's based off of intelligence and history. So we'll do that later. And then you have, of course, all of your basic stuff here. So I think I got most everything figured out. The Forge Domain spells, yeah, I already have that out. So we're ready to go as far as detailing goes. Um, but the main steps were to do the abilities, background, race, and class. Now, when it comes to leveling up, there's a couple ways you can do it. The easiest way is first go into um, create this class so you are just kind of drag this little shield so if you're not able to see my pointer it's this little shield up here if you open that up that's your class description so i'm going to drag and drop that to the hotkeys because i'll need to look at this later same thing with your background you can go ahead and shortcut that and that way you don't have to come all the way back here again as you continue building your character. That's a pretty good pro tip there if you haven't done that before. Anti-cleric. Oh, you know what? I wish I would have seen that before. That would have been so cool. I'm already kind of going the wrong way for that. Darn it. There is a, um evil priest or something like that in the Dungeon Master's Guide. So if you load up the DM's Guide, there's an option in there for an evil priest. So that would have been really cool. I wish I would have saw that sooner. Darn it. Uh, maybe next time, uh, Kaywick. That, that was a really good idea. I don't get to build evil characters very often. That would be a lot of fun. I think I'll try that next time. I made a couple evil warlocks and stuff on streams, but I've never really done an anti-cleric, which, which is really cool. Okay, so it's kind of like an anti-paladin. I think that would be a good good way to look at it, too. Okay, so to level this character up, all I t technically have to do, instead of going over here and opening up the classes and trying to figure out which book I got it from, I'm just going to drag this shortcut out and then back in, and it automatically adds the given hit points. It automatically adds any new features, so I don't think I've gained too much. Let's see, I got, oh, I got Artisan's Blessing, so I need to look at my abilities. So I have Artisan's Blessings. 
And then I also got Harness Divine Power, which is an optional thing. And then there is the, let's see, Aura's Blessing. Uh, or Is that right? Uh, no, Artisan's Blessing, that's right. So I got some hit points. I got Channel Divinity added. And I also have my, which is the Artisan's Blessings. The other part of Channel Divinity is Turn Undead. So you get two, two different you know, abilities basically to use up your um, your daily traits for your domain. So you, you can have to pick either or. So you can use the Artisan's Blessing or you can save the Channel Divinity for turning a dead. Some classes get more of it or better at it, depending on what, like if you're probably the Grave Domain, you probably get better things to control and dead and such. But anyway, so these are, uh, keeping all these over here because I'm going to have to look at that later as I'm building. So rather than coming back here all the time, I'm just going to refer to this pile of cards. And when I deal with these, I'll close them as I go. And this is something I learned from Digital Dave and Rob. So I've watched them build characters over the years and others, and I think this is a really, really good method. All right, I'm going to go ahead and level them up to level three, just for the sake of it. And here I got more points, and obviously I'm going to have a few more spells. Yeah, so here's my actions tab. So I got first and second level spells. Here's the note section where we're going to fill out the background. But I think um, for right now, I think we can move on to the next tab, which is inventory. So we kind of looked over the features. We talked a little bit and looked at the traits. He ha we dealt with the proficiencies and languages are already dealt with. So we can go on to the next uh, section. So the next section is treasure. The old way that we used to do this is go to items, and then we would, you know, manually pick things and drag them onto the sheet according to the list that comes from your background. It tells you what you start off with with background equipment and your class starting equipment. Um, to make this easier, Rob and I come up with an idea to create a module, and it's called the 5e class uh, equipment bundles. So what it does is when you go into, uh, I need to bring that button back up. It's a, it's no, not just an item. It's actually a um, parcel, which is basically a bunch of treasure. And you can drag the parcel to the sheet, and it drops it all in there. Kind of like getting a kit. Kind of works how the kits work. But um, I'll show you what I'm saying here. So I'm going to go to options, and I'm going to sidebar again, and I'm going to click parcels, and that will add this to the to the list here. So I'll leave items open in case I need to grab some other things. So I'm going to go ahead and go to parcels. And if you have more things loaded, I would go to the 5e background of class equipment bundles, just so you don't get confused. And I'm a clan crafter, so I'm going to drag this background equipment over. And all it is is a list with containing items that comes from your background. So I got a pouch, I got some gems, I got some traveler's clothes, and a chisel. So that's pretty cool. And now if I go down further in the list, the starting equipment, I will grab that for a cleric. And this chooses from list A. So if you use this module, we only built it for list A, which is the more common one. But if you have a weapon or something that you don't like and you want to swap it out, just talk to your GM. So in this case, I'm going to keep the, the uh, crossbow bolts and the light crossbow. And I'm going to find a case for it because I want to be able to store the crossbow bolts in there. So if I look at case, there is a crossbow bolt case. And if I want to switch something out, like I'm going to keep my uh, shield, but I'm going to go to chainmail instead of scale. So I'm just going to delete that. And instead of a mace, I'm going to have a warhammer. So here we have a warhammer, just a regular warhammer. And then I'm going to also grab my tools.
Yeah, I don't see any of the tools that are, you know, in my group. So if I own them or i you know, proficient, I'd like to have those on me. So we'll see how much weight it adds. So I'm going to go to tool. So jeweler's tools is basically an artisan tool. Uh, Mason's tools, same type of thing. And Smith's tools. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to grab a well, just one healing potion. So here's just a regular potion of healing. And then I think, you know, I have water skin. I have a war hammer. Oh, I wanted some throwing hammers, some light hammers. So there we go. And then I'm going to have two of those. So those are smaller hammers. And then I have my war hammer. And then I have a crossbow for, or light crossbow for long range. I am making one as a yeah, that's cool, dude. I that's yeah. I wish I would have saw that beforehand. I I kind of would like to make an anti cleric right about now. That's all right. So now what we're gonna do is organize this inventory. So right now it's just a big list. So to organize on this particular type of character sheet, it allows you to nest or to put other things in other categories. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and change this to where certain things will, will sit under different areas. So my amulet is my holy symbol, so I'm gonna definitely put that in my pouch at least. And just in case. Um, the alms box is for collecting things, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, clip, put that in my backpack. And notice I when I type here, it, it auto spells it. And you always want to spell it the same way as the container, so with a capital B, not a lowercase. So I'm going to put my blanket in there. I have 10 candles. Here's my case, so I'm going to type that next to the bolts. So now my crossbow bolts will be in that case. A uh, sensor for incense. So chisel. And yeah, let's see. Incense. I'm going to put my potion in the pouch. I have two days worth of food. I'm going to have my shield equipped, which it is. When you're doing this, you don't have to hit enter. When you do, it just creates a new line. So if when you're organizing your inventory and you put this backpack in here and if you hit enter it's just going to create a new line you don't have to confirm all you do is just click away and it'll update okay so backpack i'm going to put my gems in the pouch i got a one gem that's 10 gold pieces i think my jeweler's tools will go in the pouch and any weaponry, I will leave that out and make sure it's just equipped and ready to go, even though if I'm not using it. So I have some traveler's clothes. I'll put that in the backpack. The main thing you have to worry about is what's equipped and what isn't. So up here on the right, all the way down the side, on the other side of weight, is your carrying. So if you're carrying your backpack, your weight will show your current 
you know, how much you're carrying along with your armor and everything else. Now, I didn't grab the chain mail, so I need to grab that. All right, so there's my weight. It's 126. I thought it looked a little light. And then here's my crossbow and my chain mail, and I have my shield, a couple light hammers, and then the war hammer. So what I'm going to do is show you that if you click on this where it says carried, and if you go to worn, that's not going to change anything. But if you click it on uh, not carried, it takes the weight from whatever container that you're not carrying. So if you set your backpack down somewhere or you store it or hide it somewhere, that's your next weight here. So that might be something that comes into play when you're playing. Uh, but for right now, I'll have it carried. But anything like that you don't want to carry, that would be a good way to handle it. Or if you have a bag of holding, I'd call it a bag of holding. Give the bag an actual weight, but anything inside that, I would turn it to zero for weight. Or not have, have it equipped and it will register the weight correctly. So that's a way around that. Fantasy Grounds doesn't do coin weight, but you could create a little um, item that has roughly the weight of one coin, and then you just add up the total of all your coins and put it in on your character record, and this gives you a rough weight of how much all that coin weighs. I usually don't worry about that unless people are carrying around 10,000 gold or something like that. So anyways, that's how you do your equipment. And once you have it straightened down and equipped, if you put your shield and your armor, if it's on or equipped, it will update this sheet here. And if you click on the magnifying glass, and this is on the front page, uh, your dex bonus maximum or is, is there's no limitation from chainmail, thank God. But I got two from dex. I move at 25. I had a base of 10. The chainmail adds six. The shield adds two. And then I have a disadvantage on stealth because I'm wearing a noisy chain. So that is basically, it actually adjusts the character sheet and it makes the uh, changes here. Um, on my weapons, if you see, I don't have any of my ammunition set. So I have 20 crossbow bolts and two light hammers, which are going to be like throwing hammers, basically. And then... I think that's pretty good. And then I have the role-playing stuff. So I guess I'll be lawful good since I couldn't be evil. And he's a male. And the only thing that really matters actually here is the, well, as far as mechanics go, is the size, which determines your token size and your scaling on a battle map. And then your alignment can key from spells that are like protection from good, protection from evil. Those are the only two that really pull anything. All this other stuff is role play or, or notes. So I'm going to go ahead and do some of these bonds. So these come from your background. So if I pull up my background, which I bookmarked earlier from the front of the sheet, and you stretch this out, it'll tell you your starting gear and all those sorts of things and then your feature that you get, and then here's the tables. So you get two personalities, so I'm just going to roll. Um, I'm rude to people who lack my commitment to hard work and fair play. I can see that. Clan crafter ideal. So apparently, I'm committed to the people I care about, not to ideals. That's strange. Okay, that's cool. I can handle that. Crafter Bond. I will return to my guild one day and prove that I am the greatest artisan of them all. He probably got kicked out. All right. That might be why he's adventuring. And then roll again for the flaw. This is, I would uh, kill to acquire a noble title. I don't think so. So I'll roll again. Wow, it said that again. So I guess I'm going to have to keep it. So kill may be a strong word. It could be that he would do anything to get, uh, to acquire a noble title. That would probably be the most extreme. 
Okay, so now the log sheet. This is for Adventures League. So if you play in Adventures League, that's what this is for. I'm not going to cover that, but you can put your faction, your DCI number. You can put the adventure here. And if you open up the link, there's all your downtime activities and your magic item unlocks and your awards and all that stuff is would be documented here. Um, I'm going to go to the access tab. So this is where you're going to spend a majority of your time as a player. So if you want to be somebody that, you know, wants to have more automation, you can. Or at this point, you can just add your bonus spells and your domain, you know, your domain spells and your spells and call it good. So I'll do that first. So just as a little warning, um, once I go back past the spells, uh, the rest of the stuff's going to be all pretty much customization. So I wanted to give you a warning. So if you don't want to watch another half an hour of me yammering, then you're, you're able, you can walk away if you want. But nonetheless, um, I'm going to create a group here. And this is just going to be for my bonus spells. I'm going to keep them separate from my uh, regular spells that I get. And if I bring up my character uh, description for my, my uh, class... And if you scroll down, there's the list. So at third level, I get three cantrips. So I'm going to open up spells. And I'm using a plugin or a, a excuse me, a, a, a mod or a module. I'm using Rob Tui's coding effects. So I'm going to select the 5e effects coding spells. But if you don't have that, you can use the uh, player's handbook or whatever sources you have. So now I have this full list of spells. Now on the very bottom, there's some filters. So I'm going to go to zero. And then source, I'm going to go ahead and click cleric. All right. So I definitely want guidance. That's one of the things that I think I should have. So I'm just going to drag the spell and drop it right for its spell slots. So these are just cantrips I'm doing now. I'm going to do mending. And probably either spare the dying or sacred flame. I think sacred flame makes sense. So I have an offensive spell, kind of a buffing spell, and then a utility spell. That's kind of the balance you want if you can help it. And then this is based on wisdom, so it automatically parsed to wisdom. So... Now that the DCs are there are changed, now that it recognizes that it's based on wisdom. Now I'm going to create my domain spells. So on the very bottom right corner, I'm going to hit the edit list, which is the round button with a line through it. it looks kind of brownish red. And then I'm going to go ahead and click on the star, which is a blue button. And it just makes another group. It doesn't uh, doesn't change anything. So I'm going to put domain spells. And then I click to the left, and that will update the name of the category. So the domain spells are going to probably be more than likely first-level spells and so on and so forth. So I changed this to first level, and then I'm going to go to the Forge domain spells, and I'm just going to look for these spells. So some of these may not be in here. So I want to unfilter the actual source, and I'm just going to type. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let's see. So I was going to add manually the spells that go into the domain. 
and the list is coming from the features from this particular domain. So identify And I'm actually going to take away the level two. So here's identify. So that's going to go in my domain spells. Searing smite. And I also get heat metal. and magic weapon. So those are my bonus spells. I don't get the other ones yet because I'm not high enough level to cast the stuff. So I'll close that. And these are all my bonus spells. I put them in a different group so I don't get confused with what spells I'm picking for my actual domain. Because these are bonus, and they also count as always being prepared. So that's kind of nice. Now, one thing you should do or look at is that these will be based on wisdom. So the domain spells, I'm going to change the group here. I uh, clicked on a little magnifying glass. It pops up the, the actual power group domain. And I'm going to change this to wisdom. And the reason I'm doing that, because some of these spells have saving throws, or anything with the DC challenge rating, like such as this con save or anything like that, it will parse correctly. So that's why I changed it to wisdom because that's what these are based on. When you pick your regular spells, you don't have to do that. It, Fantasy Grounds will automatically do it. So now I'm gonna go pick my regular spells. So I'm gonna pick a few from each, each uh, level. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. So I'm going to go to level one and filter it back to dwarf, or excuse me, not dwarf, but cleric. And I just don't want to pick any of these, so I'll keep that in mind. But I'm going to go ahead and grab bless, uh, cure wounds, command, guiding bolt, and healing word. And for good measure, protection for good and evil. Now, I cannot prepare all of these. These are just spells that I'll have access to. When I go to preparation mode for the actual player, if I'm playing, I would pick in here the amount of spells that in preparation mode. I can check these off. So if I can only do, you know, like five per day, I might, I might just pick those five. And leave this one out. So it's just a matter of, you know, what you have access to and such for clerics. And now I'm going to pick from second level. And there's a chart or a list that shows you how many spells you get per level. And there's a formula. All right, just give me a moment, folks.
And I think I will grab, let's see, got hold person, spiritual weapon, lesser restoration. Let's see, continual flame, hold person, prayer of healing. I think that's good enough. I got less restoration. Yeah, so there's my spells. And then again, I would go to bless or to the uh, preparation and, and prepare the spells for the day. And that doesn't mean I can cast everything. This means that's my list I can choose from, including my bonus. Okay, so that's the spells. So if you don't want to go any further, that's pretty much all you have to worry about. The going further part of it will have to do with adding custom coding and such for the class features, the domain uh, features, and the uh, racial stuff. So I'm going to take a quick break. Um, I'll be right back. Uh, if you guys want to hang tight, uh, just give me a little bit, and uh, I'll return to the stream shortly.
All right, folks, I am back. Um, had to help the missus, but uh, so we'll continue on with this build and then we'll wrap it up. So I left off. We pretty much built the character from the beginning and now we're getting towards the end. We've already picked the spells. We set up a special domain area for the domain spells. We picked the cantrips already and whatever spells that we feel we're going to need for the campaign. Now the next thing we're going to do is actually start putting in some of the features that normally are not coded or something that you know you'd have to do yourself. So with the help of the Rob2E coding effects bundle, you can make this simpler or you can actually do it yourself. So it's up to you how you want to do them. I'm not here to sell product for anybody, but for convenience, for time, and for the sake of keeping the game running smoother, I recommend using some of these effects if you uh, once you get a little bit more familiar. So again, I'm going to go down here on the list and click on Edit List. And in the spirit of that, I'm going to take and click on Add Power. And on the right hand side, I'm going to put consumables. Now this is a totally unnecessary thing, but I usually put this on to track things. And now I'm going to add a few slots here. And what I'm going to track here is basically the consumable items that I have in my inventory. Now they are in no way connected. It's just that they have a specific uh, function and they don't cross link with anything on the actions tab. So I'm just doing this more for convenience. So I'm going to track the candles. I'm going to track my um, food and the healing potion, things like that. Rations, water, that stuff. So do I have a water skin? Yes, I do. So I'm going to go ahead and put healing potion here. Water skin. I am going to put the rations and then let's see what else do I have. Okay, so candles, healing potion, rations, water skin. So the reason I'm doing this is to make it more convenient for me to track during play and also it keep, keeps a record of what you used. So I'm going to go ahead and change now get out of the edit mode. I'm back into the standard mode here. I'm going to change this to preparation and I'm going to change these to once because they are only used one time. So you don't get to replenish or when you rest they don't come back. So. And then I'm going to add functionality to the potion. So even though I have it in my inventory, there's nowhere that really adds that function. So I'm going to add action. And then I'm going to add this plus button, which is a healing function. So I'm just telling Fantasy Grounds to add this healing function to this particular line item, which is a potion. I'm going to go ahead and open this up. Now, if you go to inventory, it tells you the description. So if you open up Potion of Healing Description, it's right here. And it says 2d4 plus 2. So I'm going to grab two four-sided dice. You right-click to add the extra dice. So it picks up one to start with, and you right-click. Drop that on there. And then for the bonus, I'll put two. Now that the bonus is in there, and the rolls now that actually has a function so when i go to play i can actually apply that to one of my fellows or myself now one caveat about this is i don't have the healing potion description so to make it convenient so i don't have to keep going back to my inventory i'm just going to unlock this item i'm going to copy the text And then I'm just going to paste it over there. So now when I want to look at the potion to see what it does, 
I have the description handy. I don't have to go all the way back to the item. So that's just a convenience thing. All the rest of these items are just going to be usages. So if I change my mode to combat and actions, now I have the little buttons that I can click on that lets me know how many I've used. And it puts it in the chat so the GM can see it too. And if I use the potion, if I click on potion, it actually disappears. If I drink my water for the day, it disappears. Now, if you go to standard mode and regular summary, you can actually uncheck those so they come back, provided you've replenished them or you bought some more. So that's how you track things. If you And that can also go for like charges on magic items or whatever you want to track. Now I'm going to create another group. So this group is called standard action. So again, I'm going to hit the edit button, click the blue star, and I'm going to call this group the standard actions group. So these are things like ready, hide, those sort of things. So standard actions is the new group. And it's all the way down here now at the bottom because it's alphabetical. And in Rob Tui's coding effects, if you open up the spells and you switch this to class features, because that's where he stored it, and get rid of all your filters, now the actions are here. So action dodge, help, hide, and ready. So those are the actions that you can take instead of casting spells or um, attacking. The, the, the main ones. Now I'm going to make another one called um, shield drop, which is going to be to remove the shield bonus. So right now, when I have my shield equipped, it gives me my full armor class. If I use the light crossbow, which is going to be two-handed, then I cannot benefit from the shield. And same thing with the warhammer. If I want to use it two-handed to get more damage out of it, I have to remove the shield bonus. So instead of going to my inventory and unequipping it each time, I'm just going to do a formula, like a little, little quick... Uh, F function that'll just do the math it'll apply a negative two it'll just cancel out the bonus so i'm going to click add action i'm going to click this little running man which is the add effect and then i'm going to edit the effect right now is nothing so the target is going to be on myself there's no expiration or anything So I called it shield drop, and now I'm just going to say AC colon, so that's armor class, negative two. So I'll go ahead and close that. Now I have an action button for that. So if I need to quickly remove it during combat, then I can just push the button. It's that simple. So my character is on the combat tracker, and let's say I want to use my warhammer or my two-handed uh, or you don't know, have to use two hands for the light crossbow so i change the handedness on my weapon to uh from one-handed to two-handed for my primary hand to two hands then what i'm going to do is in the heat of battle here i'm going to come down here to shield drop i'm just going to enable the effect and it puts it in the combat tracker as a reminder but it also does the math so it doesn't change the character sheet. It just changes the math. It, it cancels out the, the shield bonus. Once the event is over, or if I recover my shield, or maybe I go back to fighting with a shield and a warhammer uh, with one-handed, then I can come in here as a player and I can remove that effect. So it's just a convenience thing. It isn't really necessary. Your GM could easily... Um, have you roll or adjust modifiers or do these uh, modifiers on the bottom left here. This just makes it more convenient. 
So now I'm going to make another group. So as you can see, it's starting to get pretty loaded up. So if you don't want all this stuff expanded out right now, you can just double click on the tools bars here and it will compress them so that you're not looking at every single thing. And now I'm just looking at what I last worked on. So now I'm going to make another group. This one's going to be the class features group. So this is stuff that has to do directly with being a cleric. But once I click over here on the left, it'll update. And I'm going to go to, uh, I'm in the 5e effects coding class features under spells. So I'm going to, I'm going to change the anything like that in here. Maybe not. Okay, so what I'm going to do is unfilter, see if he's made anything for it. Because honestly, it just gives you the ability to run a ritual and you can craft, craft a non-magical item. Then it includes some metal and some things like that. And basically, it speeds that process up and it makes it cheaper for you. But it also... Um, you know, it, it, it's just a, a way, a kind of a cool, more of a role play thing. There's really no um, reason to, uh, it just basically allows you to create simple items. But I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop it on here anyways, just as a reminder. So it's really not going to do anything. And it's in that group. And I go ahead and get rid of my placeholder. So technically, the only thing that's really doing anything here is this uh, Channel Divinity Undead. Again, I want to make sure it's based on Wisdom, because I have some Wisdom-based stuff in here, like the Turn Undead. So now the DC Challenge Rating is correct. It was saying 8, and that's because it didn't have anything to pull from. But once I clicked up here on the header and I changed it to Wisdom, then anything in here will work right. And then you get usages on this. So um, let's see. So this guy can make little keys and kind of cool little trinkets and stuff. Um, so that is basically his two um, features that he gets from his actual class. So now I'm going to go ahead and edit again. And this time I'm going to make a racial features. Again, a lot of this stuff is above and beyond what you have to do or what you need to do. These are just ways to make your character sheets more thorough and easier and smoother to run in the long run. It's going to take a while to understand how all this stuff works, but I want to show you that it can be done. So the racial features are basically something that sometimes can be parsed and coded, sometimes not. But I'm going to go ahead and go to the Rob Tui's race traits. And I'm going to come down here to where it says dwarf. And I got the dwarven resilience. So I took care of that already and closed that. And the stone cunning feature, which gives you advantage on, on certain checks. So those are the two features that I get for being a dwarf. So not all classes and races will give you features. Like if you're a human, you're not going to have those. Unless you're a human variant, then they, you might get a feed out of it. But anyhow, so stone cunning is dealt with. Uh, channel divinity, we've already dealt with that. Respect of the stout folk is basically just a role-playing thing. Blessing of the forge. Um, what was this? Blessing of the forge. At first level, you gain the ability to imbue magic into an armor, piece of armor at the end of... Oh, that's something I need to uh, I need to grab. So if I go to spells, I'm just going to type... Um, I need to go back to class features. Cleric, Blessing of the Forge. So that goes in here. And here's your artisan's blessing. So I didn't even have to make that other one. There we go. So there's all the features that come with your class for this particular level and such. As you level up, of course, you might gain a couple features over time. But that is basically all the different things that you can use. And when you look at your divine uh, divinity, you can probably only use this once or twice a day. 
So if you go to the preparation mode, it tells you one daily, one daily. So if you use that up, it, it will replenish after you do a long rest or a short rest, depending on what it says. But this, these are both daily, so. And this is probably a daily as well, but it's more of a role play thing. So basically that is the majority of what you need to put the character together. Um, unless you have feats, there's no other reason or much else to do other than filling out your background and organizing your stuff more. Um, I do suggest as a game master and a player that once you go to first level and you're all ready to go to second, I would export the character and save it. That way, if you mess up when you're leveling up or if your DM skips out on your whatever, you'll have a copy of it. And all it is is an XML file. It doesn't contain any of this artwork or any of the, the portraits. You'll have to reassign those, but it will save all the data on your sheet. So if you go through all this trouble creating a character, export it right before you level up. That way, if you make a mistake or it gets lost, or if you want to use it in a different campaign at a different level, you'll have an instance of the character at different levels instead of just the continuous one. And imagine you're at seventh level and you make a mistake. You have to go all the way back and fix all your stuff. And that's going to be a real, real buzz killer there. You're not going to like it. So that is basically, in a nutshell, how you would build a thorough character with a lot of complicated things. Um, and again, you can just expand these out if, you know, if you're going to use that section. I can just leave them compressed. I might leave my cantrips open and maybe my class features and perhaps my standard actions. So that's all I really need at the moment. And then as something comes up in the game, I can change that. But I want to be in combat mode and actions. So this is what you want to see when you're playing. And then if you have anything that's continuous, like in this case, the racial feature that has the Dwarven Resilience, that would go on permanently. And that would be something I would just leave on for the duration of the campaign. Unless your DM removes your character off the combat tracker, which is a no-no, you have to re-add that in. Or you can uh, manually come in here and delete it off for some reason. But anyhow, so the advantage against illusions, charm, and being paralysis or paralyzed, uh, all that stuff would be role play. But the advantage or the uh, resistance may not be. So this depends on what you got. So I actually grabbed the Durgar resistance. That's why it has illusion. So I grabbed the wrong one off the list. But nonetheless, that's basically. Uh, what you would do to build a character that has a lot of features. So if I come back here and I go to uh, spells and then I go, drop back down to racial traits and then I just refresh it with no filters. Now I'm going to go to Dwarven Resilience, not Dwergar. There we go. Now I got to remove this one and I'm going to apply this. So this says resist poison, which is an actual um, feature, but advantage on saving throws is a reminder. So you get to resist it and you get advantage on saving throws. So you would just click ADV before you roll your saving throw. And then if you take damage, you're going to have resistance to it. So you'll take less damage. So that's uh, basically the, the character sheet in a nutshell. When you use your spells, you manually have to check those off because Fantasy Grounds doesn't know if you're going to cast things at first or second level. However, if you cast all of your, your spell slots, your first and second level spells will go away. So right now I don't have any first and uh, second level sp uh, spell slots, but when the GM does a long rest, yeah, they come back. So it all depends on how you manage your character. So anyways, that's a, a long kind of roundabout way to do it, but that is the uh, most thorough way that I know of to uh, make these characters as complete and as smooth as possible when you're playing.